the defining moments of my life was in a clinic that my team and I work at. We established this clinic nearly 20 years ago, and it's been running in a poor urban community in Velo since then. The clinic is run by a retired professor of pediatrics from the Christian Medical College Velo, and we see children there, about 200 a day, and these children are seen for free. And one day, while I was at the clinic, I had a father come up to me with his daughter, and he asked me, are you the periodoctor? He remembered me from a time years ago when I had been to his home on a field visit. His older son, Ashraf, had been in a rotavirus study that we did, and he was at the clinic with his daughter, Najma, who was recruited into another study. What we study in these communities is enteric infections, when you have bacteria, viruses, parasites that get inside your gut. What is it that they do? Do they pass through? Do they stick around? Do they cause disease? If they cause disease, that's diarrhea, but if they don't cause disease, they can still have effects, and these are effects on the growth and the development of children. Now, obviously, if you want to study growth and development, you need to follow children for a very long time. That means we visit them at home many times. We collect a lot of samples, mainly stool, but also blood, urine, and saliva. And the families have to come into the clinic to have their children's height and weight measured. It's not a small commitment for a family to decide to be in one of our studies. Yet, we have families to participate, and Altaf Muhammad, the father of Ashraf and Najma, was one of them. Now, he was a biri worker, and the family, all of them, rolled biris for a living. If we looked at what it meant for the family to be part of a study, we estimated that we made 324 visits to their house. We collected 167 stool samples, almost 20 blood samples, a dozen saliva and urine samples. We tracked their children over time. They had to come into the clinic 50 times. You can imagine what this means for a family in terms of commitment. Now, when I spoke to Altaf Mohammed, he told me that he knew that we were working on rotavirus and that he was very happy that there was a rotavirus vaccine now. So I asked him, did you understand that you were not in a vaccine trial? He said, yes, you told us that at the beginning. You told us you are studying how the disease affects children so that you can understand how the vaccine will work. And for Najma, she was in a trial where what you were trying out did not work out. And we had been trying a passive immunization program. How did he know that these were the results of our studies? He knew that because every time we complete a study, we invite all the children and their families to lunch. We hire a marriage hall, we have the cooks make biryani, and we talk before everyone sits down to eat. And we tell every family what the results of the study are, and we ask them questions about their participation. We answer all of their questions so that they are very clear about what has been done, what the results are. Why do we do all of this? I think we do this because I think when you do clinical research, clinical research is not something that is done to people. It is done with people. And for us, one of the defining things that I have always done when I plan a study is to think about, would I participate in a study like this? If this was my family, if these were my children, would I be willing to participate in these kinds of studies? If the answer is yes, 
Only then do we go on. Now, we've been doing research for a very long time, and this is a group that would be considered a vulnerable community. Yet, our participation rates are very high. Nonetheless, when we talk about our research to people outside, what people frequently seem to think is, you must be hiding something. You must be doing something wrong, because the picture of clinical research in India is one of suspicion. And frequently, people who think that way are not wrong. In 2012, the Swasthya Adhikar Manch filed a case in the Supreme Court stating that clinical trials that were being done in India were unethical, that side effects were being hidden, that proper informed consent was not being taken from participants. The Supreme Court asked the Drug Controller General to explain, asked the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare to provide evidence of what was going on. They did not find the answers satisfactory, and they shut down all clinical research in the country. There were no trials. Now, there had been unethical practices. There had been clinical research organizations that had mushroomed around the country and had recruited patients inappropriately. But not everyone was like that. Some of us were trying to do better quality research in India. Now, what happened after that was that a lot of the systems got cleaned up. Earlier this year, we had new clinical trials rules notified, and clinical research is really back on track. But a lot of issues related to regulation determine how we develop new drugs and vaccines. There are very few new drugs or new vaccines that have been developed in India. I was very, very fortunate to be part of the development of two rotavirus vaccines. These vaccines are now in the National Immunization Program. By the end of September, every child born in this country will receive a rotavirus vaccine that is made in India, that was evaluated in India. Now, that's the good part. But actually, when you talk to people about what it took for us to get the vaccine into the National Immunization Program, that was not simple. There was a very vocal body of people that said that we were unethical researchers, that we were hiding information. The rotavirus vaccine has a side effect. The side effect is a very rare side effect. It happens in 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 100,000 children. This is a telescoping of the intestine into itself. It's called intersusception. And in vaccines that have been licensed in other parts of the world, this has been seen. However, we had done trials in India. We had not found this side effect. And people kept insisting that we were hiding things, that we were not presenting all of the data. When I have spent my life doing research, trying to bring innovation to this country to develop new products, sometimes I'm very disappointed in what people say to us. And sometimes I'm just plain angry. How can you do this when you yourself don't do research? You don't understand what we go through in order to ensure that the research that we do is high quality. Now, when it comes to doing research, there is no question of doing research that is always 100% safe, that has absolutely no risk to it. Whether we do treatment or we do research, there are always risks and benefits. You take aspirin to zinc, there are side effects to every drug we use, to every vaccine we use. But when you design a clinical study, what you try to ensure is that that study has the best possible safety net, 
that there are processes in place that will protect participants as much as possible. So when we did the rotavirus study, we did that. And in every study that we do, we try to do the same thing. When you think about innovation, innovation requires experiment. And with experiment, that means you put people at risk. People call this making others into guinea pigs. And yes, that is absolutely true. Guinea pigs are experimental animals. And in testing drugs and vaccines for humans, we actually turn humans into experimental animals. My question to all of us is, what is wrong with that? I'd like to tell you a little story about another innovation in India. There is a typhoid vaccine that was made in India. It was a true innovation because it was the first typhoid conjugate vaccine. You take the sugar on the surface of the typhoid bacillus, you link it to a protein so that you can get a durable immune response. Now, that vaccine was tested in India for safety and immunogenicity. But when it came to WHO wanting to use the vaccine, they couldn't because there wasn't data on the efficacy of the vaccine. It had not been shown yet that that vaccine could prevent typhoid. Now, when you do a vaccine trial, what do you do? You give the vaccine to some people, you don't give the vaccine to other people, and then you wait and see who develops disease or not. And if you have a population that is vaccinated, that gets less disease than an unvaccinated population, then you know that the vaccine is working. But typhoid is a disease that doesn't come everywhere all the time. So we estimated that it would require about 100,000 people to be followed for at least two years for us to be able to answer the question of whether the typhoid vaccine was working or not. There were discussions of global experts. And then this vaccine got tested in Oxford. Why Oxford? Oxford doesn't have typhoid. But what Oxford had was something called a typhoid challenge model. This is an experimental design where you give people the vaccine and then you deliberately challenge them with typhoid bacilli. You follow the same principle as a phase three clinical trial. If people who have been vaccinated develop less disease than people who have not been vaccinated, you get an answer to whether the vaccine prevents typhoid or not. In Oxford, they did this study in about 200 participants, produced the results, gave them to WHO, WHO pre-qualified that vaccine. Pakistan is now having an outbreak of extensively drug-resistant typhoid, and the Indian vaccine is being used there. Why Oxford? So I asked one of the, I asked the researchers at Oxford to put me in touch with one of the volunteers who participated in the study. Steve has a PhD from Oxford. He works for a telephone company. And this is what he told me. He said, I live a life of privilege. I benefit from all the research that has been done and continues to be done to improve the lives of people. I could volunteer for studies that would be for diseases that I might have in the future, but I know how lucky I am to have my life, and I wanted to do something for people who were not born where I was and did not have the opportunities that I did. So this is my contribution to improving the lives of people who are not as lucky as me. There are now 400 and people, 450 people in Oxford who've had typhoid. And they've done it not because typhoid is their problem. Typhoid is our problem. So why do we not do these kinds of studies in our country? 
I thought about it and I asked some researchers at St. John's to do a public perception survey to figure out how we should think about these studies. I didn't want to go back to the community that I work with because in my community, people like to participate. They trust us, they know what we are doing and they know that we will never hide anything from them. So I said, okay, St. John's, you find out what people think. And what they came back with was very interesting. They said, people don't trust medical research in India. They particularly do not trust research that is done by companies. But they do trust their doctors. And one of the most interesting findings we have is that they said that if the doctors participate in studies themselves, then we would too. So that's informative. So I, that brings me back to the principle that I started off with. Can you do any kind of clinical research that you would not yourself be willing to participate in, that you would not be willing to have your family participate in? In the rest of the world, clinical research is taken as a higher order of medicine. Academic medical centers run clinical trials. Patients seek out these centers because they know that these centers are where the best and most informed doctors are. They know that the treatments that are available in these hospitals are not treatments that are available anywhere else or for the foreseeable future. So what will it take for India to reach that kind of standard? What will it take for us to believe in clinical research, to want to do clinical research? And the way I think about it is, we have been able to popularize the organ donation movement. When I die, I will benefit eight people. I will save a few lives. I will let some blind people see. But why is it that I cannot contribute while I am still alive? So if we are to think about clinical research, why is the medical community that is here today not thinking about participating themselves? This is what I wanted to bring to you, the idea that if there is to be true altruism, then all of us need to think about opening our minds, opening our hearts, and thinking how is it that we can contribute. Thank you.